Welcome to the Farming Biogas Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Haney of Real Agriculture and Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147. So what is biogas? So on-farm biogas systems use anaerobic digestion to recycle livestock manure and crop residue. This process produces biogas, which creates environmental and business opportunities for the farm. Anaerobic digestion creates a renewable source of energy that can be heat or electricity, and as well as natural gas that can be used on farm or sold to utilities to diversify a farm's income. Today's guest on the Farming Biogas podcast is Rob McKinley. Rob farms near Woodstock, Ontario, 70 cows, operates and farms on 200 acres, and he actually installed his biogas power plant back in the winter of 2017. Let's talk to Rob McKinley. Hey, Rob, how are you doing today? I'm doing real well, and yourself? Doing fantastic. So, Rob, why did you get into biogas on your farm? So, when we first started looking at it, I think the real thing that was interesting to us was, number one, uh, this idea of energy independence, and number two, understanding how much kind of energy we could make with the waste we had on farm to begin with. That was the two things that we started kind of scratching around. And once we got into it, we realized there were some opportunities uh, that could maybe work for us. How do you produce biogas on your farm? So at our place, what we ended up doing, we installed kind of a factory built kit, basically. The the company's called Bioelectric. They're out of Belgium. Um, and so it's a, it's a designed to be a fairly simple system for the farmer. So what we do here, and it fits in with the original sort of design intent is, you know, every day we pump manure into the reactor vessel, just a tank. Um, we add a little bit of other feed stock. So, uh, you know, we get some waste feed from a local feed mill, um, and then the waste feed from our bunk silos at the dairy, right? So like the crust on the top of the corn silage or the corners that we don't want to feed the cattle, we'll put that in the digester. And that, uh, for us, that's enough organics to, um, to produce the, produce the biogas here. But I mean, fundamentally, um, it's a pretty simple process. You know, you, you put organics in our case, manure in a vessel, you heat it up and stir it and, and you harvest the gas off the top. It, it, it's really just, it kind of sounds like, you know, using some of the resources, the feedstocks you already have, and, and kind of completing that loop, right? Is that is that a kind of a simple way to put it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that kind of holistic approach was definitely something we were interested in. And fundamentally, you know, from a mechanics of the system, yeah, that's what we're doing. We recognize that there's some, you know, basically undigested energy coming out of the manure. Uh, and we're we're finishing the digestion, digestion of it that the cattle weren't able to realize. So, Rob, what, what size is your anaer- anaerobic digester and, and how many animals support the size of the system that you have there on the farm? So, when you talk about the size of a digester system, there's a few different metrics you can look at. Uh, the vessel capacity, so for us, it's 200 cubic meters, about, I think that's about 40,000 um, imperial gallons. Uh, the other way to look at the size is the output. So, ours is an electrical-based system, so we're taking the gas burning it in an, in an engine that runs a generator and our system puts out 20 kilowatts continuous. And then in terms of animals to support the system, we milk around 70 cows and then there's a, a dry cow pen that's got a mixture of, of far off heifers and dry cows of, of about 20. So, you know, say it's about 90 cows, the manure from about 90 cows um, supports, uh, supports that size. Is there anything for for the system that you have on your farm, it, I'm sure there's, you know, you you can buy a, a digester, but you know, there's always custom customization or things that you do that may be a little bit unique. Do you have anything unique about your system? The thing that would make our system unique, if we compare it to other digesters that are uh, that you would see around the countryside, specifically in North America, the thing that's unique about ours is the scale for sure. So most of the digesters that exist in North America are much larger. Um, probably to the tune of about 10 times. So if we're talking electrical capacity, you know, if you, if you see a digester driving around the back roads, it's likely going to be a sort of a 200 kilowatt system. They're likely going to be a waste receiving site. You know, they'd be, there'd be trucks coming in, bringing organics from whether it's the restaurant industry or, you know, whatever. Um, but that's not necessarily the case here. So 
definitely the thing that makes our system unique is for sure the scale. Um, it's, you know, farm scale where we're using what we've got here on farm and, and physically too, the size of it. I mean, the tank is much smaller than, um, than you'd see on some of the other systems. And as far as, um, as far as customization, that's an interesting point. And I would say that the design intent that makes the system, you know, kind of reliable and robust is that we try to avoid customization. We try to keep it as simple as possible mm. um, and use the sort of proven equipment and solutions that the, that the OEM has supplied. So you're producing energy in, in your situation. Where does that energy, what, like, what are you doing with it? Where does it end up? Yeah. So what it looks like for us is uh, two separate generators. So inside our uh, sort of, there's a shipping container utility room that has uh, two 10 kilowatt gen sets. So it's a, a 10 kilowatt engine belt driven to a single phase synchronous generator. And that, um, so that there's two separate connections. So the one connection goes directly to the grid as part of a microfit uh, connection. And the other one is wired directly into our site as part of a net meter connection. So that the reason for the split connection really boils down to economics and the sort of framework that existed in Ontario in 2017. So, our, you know, our base load on farm before we installed anything was about 17 kilowatts. So we knew that 20 kilowatts was more than we needed. So we wanted to gain the benefit of that extra production. <clears throat> and you you get a better rate um, with the microfit than you do with the net meter. So the net meter is basically offsetting what we end up buying from Hydro One in our case. We use the 10 kilowatts first and then if there's anything needed, it comes in from the grid. So that's, that's how we make use of the energy here. So aside from the, from the revenue side, from some of the energy sales that you would be getting to go into the grid, what are some of the other benefits that you're seeing on your farm to, to, to justify installing the, 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 the biogas system? Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a good question because it sort of drives down to the kind of root of why someone would bother doing this in the first place. I mean, certainly the financial piece has to work, but for us, it was about um, it, it was about the whole holistic approach, right? So certainly, there's an odor reduction. I mean, when we spread manure out of our um, end use tank, so when you know the manure only spends 20 days in the digester, right? During that sort of digestion process, and then it gets pumped to our end use pit, which we you know already had. So when we when we haul manure, it definitely doesn't have the the same odor. Now in our area, it's pretty livestock intense part of the countryside, not a big issue either way. Um, really the benefit, um, the benefit for us really is how we make use of the liquid coming out of the digester. So in addition to making the biogas, we take the, the digestate, which is the manure after it's been digested and we run it through a, a solid separator and with those solids, we bed our cows. And that really has been a significant benefit for us. Um, it fits together with a bit of an automated process we have in our barn where the separator, you know, it unloads into um, basically an electronic uh, litter carrier. So there's a rail that goes around above all the stalls, fills up the cart, and then delivers the bedding directly to the cows, which is one less thing I have to do. And uh, it ensures that the cows always have clean bedding delivered to them daily. So as far as how the whole thing fits in with the dairy side, that really was a game changer for us. I mean, um, just having good, clean bedding always available. We really, it was a benefit that we, we, you know, we planned on it going in, but we didn't know how significant it would be. And it really is. It's a, it's really a good thing for sure. That, that's pretty cool. It's like a, it's like an integrated puzzle. Like, you know, what are, what are all the things that we can do to get as much use out of this system as we possibly can? Besides, obviously, like I mentioned the, the revenue. So that's, that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. Uh, in terms of environmental benefits, uh, what, what, what are some comments that you have there in terms of how this potentially helps you from an environmental pr perspective? Yeah, the, the main thing there would be GHG, GHG reduction. Um, there's a few different sources. 
there's a there is some benefit in terms of soil health as well. I mean, if you if you look at organic matter of soil um, manure that's been digested, that organic matter is broken down a bit before it gets land applied. That's definitely a bit of a slower realization for the benefit. But the GHG reduction, um, that's that's significant. I think the thing with the thing with that. So there's a few different sources for us with the bedding system that eliminated the need um, to truck in sand bedding in our case, and also eliminated the need to dig the sand out of the manure pit after the fact. And I think when you take a look at projects and do GHG evaluations, the biggest benefit always comes from reducing fossil fuel uh, consumption, right? So that for us, you know, we're able to see those benefits there. And then in terms of reduction, if we, if we just look at the digestion portion, you know, we're, we're, capturing the methane and burning it off. Certainly there's CO2 emitted from the engines, um, but that CO2, you can think of it, that would be the equivalent of the CO2 that would be emitted from the, you know, the corn stalk of the corn silage decaying in the field. You know what I mean? So that's mm-hmm. like kind of part of the carbon cycle. The the bits that would not be would be the methane that would be off-gassed with the manure in the pit, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, GHG reduction for sure. I mean, at our farm, as part of our project, we got some government funding, and part of that was a an evaluation of of the GHG emissions for you know a period of time. And on an annual basis, um, this sort of calculation showed that we would go from you know about 150 tons a year down to 50 tons a year. Now, if you know the, the anything about the carbon market, you realize that's not. I mean, that's not a deal breaker in terms of revenue that you could get for carbon credits for a single farm. But if you take a look at that opportunity and spread it across the industry, even at a one or 2% adoption rate in a province like Ontario, where there's, you know, 3,500 dairy farms, um, it, it becomes significant for sure. So let's talk about the financial side of this. And, you know, these systems can range from, you know, it's like 350000 all the way to multi-million dollar investments. When you made the decision to go this direction, you know, what has been your expectation in terms of a payback period? For sure. So when we got into the nuts and bolts of it, I mean, it's just like anything else. You start putting, putting your budget together and you start adding up the financial aspects of the project. So for sure, there's the electricity savings plus the revenue side. Uh, the revenue, the savings bit is, is kind of tricky because... You have to, there's some infrastructure costs uh, that you you still have to pay for. But anyway, we, you know, you run those numbers for the revenue side and then you start looking at what you can knock off. So for us, uh, betting for sure, um, we don't have to buy, um, don't have to truck sand in anymore. And then uh, we got a bit of, a bit of grant money from the government and we were always aiming for kind of a 10 year payback. And so that's what we've landed on. Um is you know simple payback on ten years while cash flowing the debt servicing. It, and Rob, do you, how how long do these systems last? Like, so it's a ten year payback. Let's say, um, is like how long will you you put your system in? What's the life expectancy of it? There's a there's a few items that are maintenance items. The engines for sure uh, will get changed out, but they're not a big ticket thing. And and the maintenance we carry the maintenance allowance inside uh, the budget. I think there's there's some items that need to be repaired, but I mean, I don't see any reason why the system won't run for, you know, you keep it up 20, 25 years. What are some of the challenges that you have had to tackle and in, in, with this system and, and how did you how did you overcome them? Well, from a installation point of view, we had a couple of roadblocks. Um, anyone that's brought equipment over from Europe will uh, will sort of chuckle to themselves as this being kind of a newbie rookie mistake, but we had some issues with electrical certification for sure, um, which uh, was overcome simply by, you know, we had to rewire a bunch of stuff in the container. Um, so you just roll up your sleeves and do it. Um, and then from an operations point of view, it's just like anything else, any new piece of equipment, there's nuances to the equipment that you need to learn sometimes the easy way, sometimes the hard way. But, um, we've had really good technical support from the guys in Belgium. They're always available on the phone. Um, I would say parts availability, anything, 
you know, trying to get um, bits and pieces, whether we try to source them locally here, you know, in Southwestern Ontario, we're kind of spoiled in terms of availability of, well, everything. So you just have to adjust your expectations, you know, when you're trying to source a valve that may not be typical in North America, you got to find a source for it, either bringing it back from the OEM or someone else in Europe. But in general, it's been, it's been pretty good. Uh, but it's like any, it's like anything, you kind of got to manage your expectations with a new piece of equipment. Yeah, absolutely. Whether that's, whether that's a digester or that's a new tractor, right? Um, oh yeah. Yep. So you're living this, you're, you're obviously, you're having some success with, with your system. There's some producers listening to this that are like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I should be looking into this. What words of advice do you have for some of those farmers that are interested who want to get started? Are, and are there any specific areas that you suggest that they, they, they focus on first? Well, as I mentioned before, I think the desire for a project like this needs to be bigger than the financial part. Um, certainly that has to work, but the farmers that I think should tackle this are farmers that aren't afraid to try new things and are interested in that whole idea of energy independence. Um, and then if you, if you make that choice that, yeah, this is something I want to get into, I would say, make sure that you size, this is kind of a technical detail, but make sure you size the electrical capacity to suit your feedstock so that you're not kind of chasing, you know, a number that you can't get. So just be realistic kind of in what you can expect from a production point of view. And then, you know, the other kind of nut and bolt detail, if you're spending half a million dollars in, in, uh, in whether it's U S funds or euros, man, book your money when you do your budget. (laughs) That's, uh, that's good advice for sure. Yeah, you, you just look at the Canadian dollar, what it's done in you know in the past year, right? We had a sixty-eight cent dollar, we've had a seventy-nine cent dollar, so that, yeah. that that's a big difference when you're talking this size of, of investment. Great stuff. So, Rob, we'll finish up with this. If you had to do it all over again, like you're you're one of those people that's in the audience, and you're yeah. you're you're interested in installing one of these systems or thinking about it, if you had to do it all over again, what might you do differently, or maybe just the same? So differently, and this is all going to be related to operational kind of reliability, I would say winterize the system better. So, and the OEM has been working on that in the meantime, they've got some systems in Poland and Sweden that have winters like ours, but that is definitely, you know, make sure that all the water lines are either heat traced or, or well protected. Um, I'd put a bigger tank in probably to have a longer retention time. And then uh, from, from a point of view of actually pumping the manure into the tank, I would say have reliable or open kind of clean outs so that if you end up with issues uh, pumping manure, it's quick and easy to, uh, to kind of keep things, to keep things going. That was what I would do differently. And then for the same, um, man, use that bedding system. I think there's, there's huge benefits of, of having that, those separated solids. Um, it's, it's good, clean bedding and it's always available. I would make, I would make that a hundred percent part of uh, part of a project if I were to do it again, for sure. Great stuff. Hey Rob, thanks a lot for joining us here today. All the best to you and uh, look forward to the next time we get the chance to chat. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for your interest today. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Farming Biogas Podcast. I want to encourage you to visit farmingbiogas.ca to learn more. This podcast was brought to you by the Canadian Biogas Association. If you have any questions or comments about today's podcast, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com or call the Real Ag Listener line 855-776-6147. Thanks for getting real and getting connected with Real Agriculture.